So today's speaker is Dr. Aaron Goldberg. Aaron did his PhD at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Professor Daniel James. His thesis was entitled Disquisitions on Quantum Enhanced Polarimetry. Aaron is currently a researcher at the National Research Council of Canada, where he's working on various aspects of theoretical quantum optics and quantum information processing. I would have liked to invite Aaron to talk about his current work on the quantum mechanics of backwards time travel. However, Dr. Aaron Goldberg is a world leading expert on quantum sensing and metrology. So it feels like a, a, a more appropriate thing to invite him to talk about his recent results on the fundamental limits uh, of multi-parameter estimation. So with that, Aaron, the, the, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for this kind introduction and thank you all for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to share my screen. Thank you for the opportunity to share some, some what I consider to be really interesting results with you. Um, and so I, I put two titles to this talk. One is, is the title of the paper, that's the smaller one. But the title that I like to say is, is longitude or latitude more important for determining your location? And this question has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, nothing to do with quantum measurements, quantum theory, but I'll be able to connect it and I'll be able to answer this question. And I think by answering this question, um, we'll be able to get some intuition about different things in, in quantum estimation and quantum metrology, and we'll, we'll learn some exciting results along the way. So again, my name is Aaron Goldberg. Uh, this research was started at University of Toronto, initially with Hugo Ferretti. Um, we've now both left University of Toronto. I'm, uh, I actually also joined the University of Ottawa. And then our additional collaborator, Luis Sanchez Soto, is in a uh, superposition of being in Madrid and uh, Erlangen. So let's do some motivation. Um, and we can be deep and say, let's say we're trying to find ourselves. And you can put together this, uh, these are composite images of the globe from NASA. It's just spinning. And if you want to know where you are and you Google search, where is Ottawa, you're likely to get the name of the country or you're going to get some coordinates in latitude and longitude. And so Ottawa is a bit further south than Cambridge, it's further west. Um, and this tells you something. And if you Google it, you'll get something like four or five decimal places for each of these numbers. And I've chopped them off. But my question is, is a little bit of a basic question. And it says, does it make sense to have the same number of decimal places for each of these coordinates? Right, you could think longitude and latitude. It's if you were just trying to find your place on a flat grid, then knowing where you are, X and Y coordinates wouldn't make any difference, which one has more precision. But latitude and longitude, you're on a curved surface. Um, are you happy to say you have the same um, relative uncertainty for each of these coordinates? And I'm gonna answer this question that the answer is gonna be no, and we'll learn something about regular or classical curved geometries, and we'll learn something about quantum measurements at the same time. And just while we're here, um, I'm gonna point out that the National Research Council, which is headquarters in Ottawa and Canada, is on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquian Anishinaabe and Mohawk peoples. And this is an important thing to mention because of this word unceded. And even though it's a federal, um, a federal institution, we still have a lot of steps that need to be taken toward reconciliation and, and really understanding the rights of different peoples on this land. So let's go and find ourselves and let's do some quantum mechanics. If you want to know where you are, you have to measure something. And the broad goals of metrology are to measure things well. And measuring things is a really vague thing, but I could say you could measure anything. You could measure where you are, you could measure the strengths of electric and magnetic fields, you can measure how far away something is, you can measure how hot something is. And typically, different resources let you do this better. And you wanna make efficient measurements so that you spend the least amount of time or money or energy in performing this because if you had more time or energy or money, you could probably do something better. And the goal is to use these resources in a clever way such that you get very accurate measurements 
So on average, what you get is actually the correct value of the thing you're trying to measure and precise measurements. You don't want lots of noise. You want to have low variances. You want to have a high degree of confidence in the numbers that you get. And in quantum mechanics, we talk about the actual limits of how well you can measure something. Maybe you want to measure something really well, but it disappears after a fraction of a second. You're trying to measure a gravitational wave passing through the Earth, and, and the characteristic time scales are very short. Or you're probing something very gentle, and if you look at it too hard, you'll knock it, you'll damage it, and you won't be able to continue to use it. And so quantum metrology says, how can you? expand on these goals of quantum metrology and get more accuracy and more precision, um, more efficient measurements for some unit of resources that you can then probe things more quickly or more fragile things and do better. This is the broad goal of metrology. You can also talk about discriminating between possibilities like is the traffic light red or green? Am I driving on the left or the right hand side of the road? And this could come under the umbrella of metrology. Um, depending on who you ask. And so there are things you can measure that are continuous and you're trying to find the value or discrete things where you're trying to say, is it one of these discrete different categories? And so the reason people talk about quantum metrology, this is what I said a little bit before, is that, um, is I'd say twofold. One is that in quantum mechanics, everything fundamental is about measurement. There's this measurement problem, things change when you measure them. And this isn't so true in classical theory where you can measure something. And fundamentally, when you talk about measuring something, you don't expect that something to change in your act of measurement. But we know quantum mechanically that everything will change in some way when you measure it. And so this probing, um, if you want to know the actual limits of how well you can measure something, you have to take into account quantum mechanical effects. Now, these things change because they're fragile, but fragile things are also very sensitive. And very sensitive things mean that they change a lot for you changing just a little bit what you do to it. And that means you could get a very sensitive measurement if you use fragile quantum states. And this fragility comes in the form of quantum correlations that contain information, and you can use information to uh, learn things about uh, parameters that you're probing. And these things have been shown theoretically and experimentally to give you quantum advantages in precision. So the, the classical thing that people talk about is the shot noise limit, which says, especially if you're measuring something with light, but also in, in many other ways, um, your uncertainty can always go down if you integrate for longer, if you use more energetic probe states, if you shine more light on something. And the uncertainty scales is one over the square root of this resource, which I'm calling energy here. And quantum mechanically, if you use special states with special quantum correlations, you can do better and get a scaling of one over the energy. So if you needed a, a million photons to get a particular uncertainty with your classical estimation, you would only need a thousand photons with the correct quantum correlations to get the same uncertainty. And this could be useful for probing something fragile. So that's quantum metrology. Um, that's what people do. And people then look for different places where this can be applied, different physical situations, different parameters, and try and find these advantages and make them work. Sorry, we have a question here. Please. The, so it's an anonymous question from the chat. Uh, this person asks, is the fragility that you describe here related to entanglement? Uh, yes. So, so that's an important question because I didn't actually describe what these quantum correlations are. Um, and so for quantum metrology, it's actually not quite clear which quantum correlations are the best. For some protocols, it's entanglement. For some protocols, it's something like coherence. And so um, what we can really just say is that things that you don't see on a macroscopic scale must have been so fragile that they disappeared when you went from something small and isolated to something that you could see. And so that kind of fragility includes effects like quantum entanglement. And so the fragility in quantum entanglement can be used if you tailor it in a particular way to be very sensitive to changes in some parameters. And, and yes, quantum entanglement could be the cause of these quantum correlations that contain lots of information, but there are also other um, different ways that you can get these advantages with other uh, quantum effects, weird superposition states that you couldn't see classically. And even if there's no entanglement, 
you could still have interesting quantum correlations. Um, you could say with just a single mode or just a single, um, yeah, it's say a single mode that would give you extra information. So entanglement is one possibility, but it's not the only possibility. So maybe, maybe this picture, um, if there's a follow-up question, I can for sure answer it. Um, but if not, I'm going to go on with this picture because pictures are better than words. And this is my picture of all of estimation theory, quantum, classical, or anything after quantum that you can ever think about. The idea of estimation theory is you start out with a probe that's going to try and probe some parameter. And we can call that parameter theta. And this parameter will be imprinted on the probe through some sort of interaction. Um, so if, you, if you're trying to measure the temperature of something, then you put the thermometer into the object and you try and measure its temperature, and then the thermometer changes its state. And now this probe has acquired some dependence on the parameter through whatever dynamical process it was. And what you have to do is take that changed probe state and do some measurement on it so that you get some data that depends on the value that the parameter must have been. And then you take that data and you have to supply a theory that says, given this data, I think that the parameter must have been some guess. And we call this guess an estimator. We, we put a, a hat on top of it and we have this estimate of the parameter theta. And this is what we get from the data, our knowledge of the probe state and the dynamical process and our knowledge of some theory. So here, I, I guess I should have put this, this example up earlier. Um, you can have a thermometer as your probe state with some column of mercury, and that's your initial state, and you're using it to sense how hot this star is. If you put the thermometer into the star, the column of mercury will start to go up, it expands. The probe state now depends on uh, the parameter of interest. To measure it, you take out a ruler and measure how tall the column of mercury is, and then you use a theory that says this length of a column of mercury corresponds to this temperature. And then that gives you an estimate for the temperature in the star. And this can be true um, for, for any estimation problem, classical and quantum. And what's really neat is that um, these steps have all individually been optimized and together been optimized. And I can tell you a prescription for how to do everything perfectly, assuming you're only measuring one parameter at a time. And so there are various different things. Um, if you assume that the dynamical process is fixed, uh, you just have a star and you're trying to measure its temperature. You don't get to um, change what the star is or you don't get to change the person's body temperature before you measure it. That's a fixed dynamical process. Then what you can do is you can change the probe state, you can change the measurement that you do, and you can change the way that you go from the data to an estimate of your parameter. And if you wanna just change the probe state, there's this quantity known as the quantum Fisher information that right away tells you how good any probe state will be for measuring some parameter. And so since this is just one quantity and it can be calculated, what you can do is just search through all possible probe states and find the one that gives you the biggest quantum Fisher information, meaning it'll give you the most information about this uh, dynamical process, about this parameter that you could ever get through any measurement. And that tells you the ideal probe state. And then that doesn't care about the measurement, but then you can go and say, what measurement would I have to do with this ideal probe state in order to get the perfect data, get the most amount of information possible? And there's some theory that tells you what to do. It might not always be an easy measurement, but it always exists. And then to go from the data to a guess about what the parameter must have been, um, this is going from classical data to another uh, parameter on a computer. And so this has all been optimized with classical estimation theory. Um, these are all decades old. They can all be optimized individually and together. But I've written in the title, I wrote the word single parameter estimation because multi-parameter estimation is not so, uh, so well characterized. It's, it's very well studied, but each of these steps isn't individually optimized in the same way, and it makes the problem much richer. And it's what I'll tell you about today. And for example, if you're not just trying to measure how tall you are, but you're trying to measure your latitude and your longitude at the same time, what would you have to do? How would this change? How would the steps of these process change a little bit? And so the idea is, 
in the real world, normally you can't just keep everything fixed and measure one parameter at a time. Normally everything changes at the same time. And so if you wanna do a measurement, you have to actually talk about measuring more than one thing that can change at the same time. And for example, if you're trying to measure something about a magnetic field, you might wanna know its strength, but you're also gonna to need to know its orientation. Or if you're doing spectroscopy, you're trying to find out how much light is absorbed by some say molecule, some, some gas, um, but you wanna know how much light is absorbed at every single wavelength or every single frequency. And you've got, you can make them discrete, but you've got tons of different frequencies that you're trying to make a fingerprint of these molecules to see how much light was absorbed at every single frequency. And you can say, let's say we have D different parameters and you want to start with a probe state, have an interaction that's gonna depend on all these different parameters, do a measurement on your probe state after it's interacted, and try and make an estimator for, uh, and try and guess what all those parameters are. There are lots of different things there to optimize. You can talk about the variance of each of the parameters. You can talk about the covariances between each of the pairs of parameters. And there are D, like the order of D squared, different quantities to optimize at the same time. And so what are you gonna do? Are you gonna use a, a how can you find a, a probe state that optimizes all these things at the same time? How can you find a measurement that gets the most data about all these things at the same time? And especially if these things are changing really quickly, you have to do them all at the same time. You don't necessarily get the opportunity to start with a probe state that optimizes one parameter and then do a procedure that optimizes the next parameter. If you have to do it all at once, what do you do? And this is what I'll tell you how to do. Um, and what's nice is we get um, some of the classical and quantum information uh, measurement theory still carries forward to the estimation of multiple parameters. And what we get is this really useful equation known as the quantum Kramer-Rau bound, which says that this covariance matrix, which tells you all the different variances and covariances of every parameter that you're estimating relative to what the true parameter must have been, is lower bounded by the inverse of a matrix known as the quantum Fisher information matrix. And that quantum Fisher information matrix is a matrix, but it depends only on the quantum state, on the probe state, and the values of the parameters that you're trying to measure. And what it doesn't depend on is the measurement process. So again, you can use this to say, I can look for the biggest quantum Fisher information matrix. And if I have a really big one, then this bound, the inverse will be really small. And then we can, uh, in some sense, have really low variances and, and uncertainties for all these parameters. But it's a strange thing to say, what's, what makes a matrix big? Uh, and what makes the inverse of a matrix small? We're talking about a whole matrix. We, we have to look at all the different elements. It's a bit strange. A matrix inequality means that the difference between the left and the right-hand side is positive semi-definite. It's not really exactly telling us what each element of the matrix is doing at the same time. And so we have a bit of a, um, a multiplicity of things to do, uh, and, and it's not really clear what to optimize when you're estimating multiple parameters. Sorry, I have another question for you. Please. This, so is, this is another anonymous question. Sure. Is it possible to achieve this lower bound? Ah, yeah, that's probably on this slide. Um, you asked this question. Is it possible to saturate this lower bound? And the answer is sometimes. Um, so it's a great question. In single parameter estimation, um, I'm just reading off the slide now, there is always a measurement that saturates the bound. If there is only one parameter, and it's not a matrix, I can, uh, I can write down what the optimal measurement is. It might be hard to do in practice, but it's always possible. For the multiple parameter case, there's sometimes possible to saturate the bound, and sometimes it's not possible. And it's because fundamentally different measurements, different parameters um, don't commute. Uh, we have uncertainty rules for say, position and momentum in quantum mechanics. And you can't simultaneously do the best estimate for each of them. Uh, there, there are some limits. But what's very nice, and this is, I'd say this inequality has been around for decades, but it's only been in the last, I want to say five years, it might even be, be less than that, that people have shown that it's always possible to get within a factor of two of saturating this bound, uh, even for multiple parameters. And that's really nice because it means that if you 
if you just calculate this right hand side um, and all you do is you uh, find the best probe state and you don't care about what measurement strategy you're using, um, somebody out there has guaranteed for you that there exists a measurement strategy that will get you almost fully to, sa to saturate in this band. And that's important, a factor of two is, is, is a lot sometimes, but typically for quantum advantages, we're talking about scaling advantages. So if you have something that scales as one over n or one over n squared, that's gonna swamp a factor of two very quickly by just changing n by one. And so we can essentially get very close to always saturating this band. Um, so, so more properties of this matrix is, is just to reiterate, the matrix only depends on the probe state and the process uh, that's evolving and the values of the parameters. It doesn't depend on the measurement strategy, but then you can go through all this uh, mathematical chicanery and find out exactly what the measurement strategy is that will get you very close to the ultimate bound. Sorry, there's another question. Yeah, there's another question. I think you might have answered this, but I think it's a follow-up question. It's what if the measurement that saturate, saturates the kramer rao bound depends on the parameter itself? Ah, uh, yes. So that is often the case. It's often the case for single and multiple parameter estimation. And so what you have to do is um, talk about the, the range of validity of this lower bound. And it turns out it's only possible to saturate the bound in an asymptotic limit where you've done lots of measurements, you already know the parameters pretty well. So this is the ultimate uh, precision you can get um, if you, you've got a good idea of what the parameters should be and, and you're just trying to get even extra decimals of precision in. If you have no idea what the thing is to start with, you'll have to use some sort of adaptive scheme that starts out with a completely different measurement process to learn some information. And then the final thing you would do in this adaptive scheme would be this measurement that depends on the, the true parameter. And what you get is that if your guess for the true parameter is sufficiently close to what the true parameter is, then um, this measurement that you make with your guess for the true parameter will be incredibly precise and incredibly sensitive. And so uh, just another question as mm -hmm. well. I think it's always in the same vein, but is this in the large measurements limit with many trials? Yes. So, so I treat those almost as equivalent. Um, I say you have to have a lot of information about the, the parameters and to have a lot of information, you probably had to do a lot of measurements to start with. Um, but I, I wouldn't say you don't need an infinite number of measurements if you already, someone promised you that the parameter was really close to some values and you were guaranteed that it was already within a really small range, then you wouldn't have to do an infinite number of measurements. Um, that would save you, I'd say, a large number of measurements. So yes, uh, it's true in the sense of needing a large number of measurements, but most of those are necessary in order to just get more information about what the parameter is. And then ultimately, whenever you do a measurement that's probabilistic, you need to build up enough statistics in order to uh, rely on the, the data itself, themselves. Great. So um, this multi-parameter stuff. So those questions are actually still relevant, uh, all for single parameter estimation. The only caveat for multi-parameter estimation is that you have a matrix inequality, so your measurements don't always saturate the bound but they get close, they can always get pretty close to the bound. And so we, we can rely on actually the same mathematics as single parameter estimation for figuring out asymptotics and adaptive strategies and how close you have to be with your guess in order to get this ultimate precision. So I, yes. So here I've written that these are the steps you do when you try and do a multi-parameter estimation problem. You, say I'm trying to measure latitude and longitude and I want to optimize one set of measurements. So to do that, you make some combination that says, I want to optimize the sum of the variances of my latitude and my longitude estimates. Or I care more about longitude than I care about latitude, so I want to um, give twice as much weight to the longitude variance as I do to the latitude variance. And somehow you come up with some quantity that tells you what combination of these covariance matrix elements you want to minimize. And you take that single quantity and you optimize that. You look for a probe state that optimizes that quantity. Um, you hope to 
get an advantage relative to a classical probe state that you would do. And if you get an advantage, then it's worth looking into the resources for making that probe state and finding the measurement process that would give you the amount of precision that the probe state promises you. And this is what we do. Um, and in this paper, that's, that's the subtitle of the title of this talk, um, we explain a uh, unique prescription for how to do all these steps, removing all the ambiguity and how we can use it to always find a probe state. We can automatically find the optimum and find the measurements that saturate the bound for a wide class of dynamical processes. Not everything in the world, but, but something pretty large. And so to do this, we have to talk about uh, a little bit of math. Um, so there's a lot of things on the screen, but I'll actually tell you that they're all things you can do and, and they're very nice. Um, if you have a pure state that's subject to a dynamical interaction that keeps the state pure, and now the state depends on the parameters, this is gonna be a bold theta over here. And you wanna take that probe state and you wanna estimate, and, and you wanna um, construct what the quantum Fisher information should be. Then to do that, all you need to be able to do is take derivatives of that state with respect to the different parameters that are changing and to take inner products of, of these derivatives with the original state or with derivatives with respect to other parameters. This is all something you can do. Um, and once you do that, um, it tells you the quantum Fisher information. And then if you wanna make a single parameter, a single, sorry, a single scalar value to optimize, um, not just choosing one of these covariance matrix elements, but saying, I want some amount of this particular variance and some amount of that particular covariance, and I wanna add them all together and to minimize that whole quantity, then you can call that a single weighted mean square error of your estimate, of your estimator. And mathematically, you can write this as the trace of some weight matrix times your covariance matrix. And what's nice is that you can do this thing on both sides of the quantum kramer rao bound. And then you get, instead of a matrix inequality, a scalar inequality, which says that this whole weighted mean square error matrix is lower bounded by the trace of this weight matrix times the inverse of your quantum Fisher information matrix. The weight matrix you choose, quantum Fisher information matrix you can calculate directly, and that's all you have to do. What we'll do is we'll tell you the best way to choose the weight matrix, how you find the biggest quantum Fisher information matrix, and how you optimize all these things. And if you want to make life even easier, you can add a little bit more math, which says, let's say your evolution was unitary. And you know for sure that you started out with a pure state and you had some unitary interaction that depended on these different parameters. Then you can talk about the generators of this unitary evolution. So essentially it's like if you took a derivative of the state, you would get this, this generator as multiplying the state. It's like a Hamiltonian in some sense where the generator of time evolution for your state is the Hamiltonian then you just need to look at the covariance of these generators to figure out what the quantum Fisher information is, and those covariances would be taken with respect to the quantum state. So these are all things that you can calculate. They're all calculable, and so to do it, let's just do it. And, and I'll show you that you can do it. We can do some of it together, and, uh, and you'll see how useful this quantum Fisher information step is. So let's say you're trying to find out your latitude and longitude. Or let's say you have a qubit and you're trying to find out uh, it's in a pure state someone promises you and you're trying to find out what its state is. And if it's a qubit or something on the surface of a unit sphere, it can be parameterized by two coordinates, uh, a theta and a phi, a polar and an azimuth angle. And if it's a, a qubit and it's not a person on the earth, then you can talk about a superposition of a ground and excited state or a spin up and spin down, a zero or one or whatever convention you like. And to find out quantum Fisher information, you just need to be able to take derivatives of the state with respect to the different parameters. And that's pretty nice because we can take derivatives of sine and cosine. I put the factor of two on the left-hand side. I hope that doesn't bother you. And we just flip things nicely. And if you take a derivative with respect to this azimuthal angle, then you just retain one term. And that's all you need to do. Now you just need to find out overlaps between these three different things and, and arrange them into a matrix. And what you get is a quantum Fisher information that happens to be diagonal, which means its inverse happens to be diagonal. 
and you get this matrix inequality for the covariances between these different coordinates as lower bounded by what's on the right hand side. And so we can look at each thing individually. It says that the variance of our polar angle is always going to be lower bounded by one in particular units. The variance of our, our azimuthal angle is lower bounded by something that depends on the polar angle. And the covariances are lower bounded by zero, so that it's always possible to measure these things with the covariance of zero at the ultimate limit. You could have these quantities be completely independent. And what's important to realize is that the terms on the diagonal are different. The lower bounds are different, which means that we've broken this. These two parameters are not created equal. Latitude and longitude are not the same. Um, and, and this might make sense to you if you think about trying to define an azimuthal angle when the polar angle is zero. It, it shouldn't actually be possible to do. You should have a lot of uncertainty. And, and fundamentally, you do. And this is reflected in the quantum Fisher information. So just rewriting that here, I moved this matrix up. I hope, I hope that's not too quick. What we have is that if the polar angle is zero or if the polar angle is pi, so if it either points to the top or points to the bottom, then you can't find the variance. Uh, so the variance on the azimuthal angle will blow up. You can't find it. The variance is infinity, which is a bit too high, but, but it's because there's a coordinate singularity can't even define the angle at that point. And this might be familiar if you've done any geometry on a sphere or in anything curved, you'll probably have started with the sphere. Because if you try and measure a distance on the surface of the sphere, you actually consider latitude and longitude to be different. If you try and find some infinitesimal distance and you try and decompose that into small uh, changes in the polar angle and small changes in the azimuthal angle, you would know that you have to weight those changes in the azimuthal angle by sine squared of the polar angle. And if you write this as a matrix, which, which is what you normally do with a, if you have a metric tensor and it's a, it's a two, yeah, 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 two coordinates, then you can write it as a matrix. And if you choose that matrix as your weight matrix, then you would exactly cancel the singularities in here things would look like a diagonal matrix with ones. We'd look like we have an identity matrix. We'd have reinstated the equivalence between the two coordinates. So it's, it's, it's contrived, but I'll tell you it works. And so what you can do is say, let's say instead of minimizing the variance of the polar angle and the variance of the azimuthal angle, you minimize the sum of the variance of the polar angle and sine squared of the polar angle times the variance of the azimuthal angle then I'm going to tell you, I'm going to claim that that's the proper quantity to minimize. And that's the one thing. It's one thing. So you can find a probe state that minimizes that. And what it tells you is that you should always give more importance to this uncertainty than to that uncertainty. And so the latitude is always more important than the longitude. Um, so that answers the title question, at least for me. And, and these things prop up all the time. So for example, if you're trying to integrate in spherical coordinates, then you know that the integration measure depends on your polar angle. Uh, you always need to consider this metric. You have to know what the coefficient is of the different things. And a practical time when this comes up is, let's say you want to generate random points on the surface of the sphere, then you shouldn't just generate uniform distributions of polar and azimuthal angles, because then things look different depending on your perspective from which you orient the sphere. But if you use a uniform distribution, uh, distributed according to this proper integration measure using the metric, then you get something that looks the same from everywhere. Quick uh, question Please. interruption here. So I think this is a good example that, that answers the question a bit, but in what scenario would one choose the weight matrix that you presented on the, on the previous slide? Yes. So, so what I'm going to argue at the end of the day is in every scenario, you should do this. Um, and what I'm going to argue is that this is, there's, you might start out, you're sitting on the surface of the earth and you don't know uh, what's more important, latitude or longitude, but there's actually other things out there in the world that tell you what's more important. And that important thing is the metric because it tells you uh, if you were trying to just calculate distance, how would you give relative importance to going north versus going east? 
And there is, there is a, a mathematically proper way of giving relative importance to them. And that's what's codified by the metric. And so using the metric um, as your weight matrix gives you, uh, it gives you what mathematically would put these two coordinates on equal footing. So the argument is that um, because you're in some particular geometry automatically tells you what the proper uh, combination of the different components is. So anytime that, that the coordinates are, are, have some sort of geometrical structure to them, I would say is when you should use the metric. And I'll give you another example. Because um, this is the one that really got us thinking. Um, we, were, we were trying to do something similar uh, where we're trying to do some estimation problem. We're trying to measure all three parameters of a rotation simultaneously. And so that could be like if you're measuring, you, you're rotating around um, some axis and the axis depends on two angular coordinates and your rotation angle is another parameter. Or if you want to parameterize your rotation by Euler angles, there's always going to be three parameters. And so it's not always easy to figure out um, what combination of those parameters you should be optimizing. And this is, there's like lots of physical applications of rotation sensing from like knowing what orientation your GPS satellite is in or doing measuring magnetic fields, measuring polarization, things like that. And uh, this problem has been studied um, as almost as a, as a paradigmatic example of quantum enhancements and estimation for when you do know the rotation axis. And if you're just measuring an angle around a fixed axis, you can always get a variance that scales as one over n squared, where n is some sort of resource like energy you're putting in. And that would be if you use quantum resources and classically you could only get a one over n. So we have these promises of quantum advantages for estimating a rotation angle if you're given a known rotation axis. And the way you do it is you either use, if you're measuring magnetic fields, ooh, that's bad notation, I'm sorry. This should have been an up arrow and a down arrow. Um, use spins that are in this, uh, um, this superposition state that they're either all spin up or all spin down. Or if you're measuring something like polarization, um, you could, in an interferometer or polarization, you would have two different modes and you have a, an entangled state where all the photons or all the bosons are in one mode or all of them are in the other mode. And so this is single parameter estimation. And if you want to start thinking about multi-parameter estimation, the first step you do is just extend the single parameter estimation to be more general, where these states are optimal if you know the rotation axis. But if you want to find a state that could be optimal for another rotation axis and for all of the rotation axes and find the best possible precision average over all rotation axes, there's a special class of states that can do it. And, and they go by a bunch of different names and there's lots of really cool math and physics and that's, that's for another talk. Um, but we have these special states. And so what we did was we took these special states and we looked at what the quantum Fisher information would be for estimating all three parameters of a rotation simultaneously. So measuring the rotation angle, measuring two parameters of the rotation axis, the rotation axis is polar angle and it's azimuthal angle. And what you get is a matrix. Uh, it scales quadratically with the number of resources, which means you can get a quantum advantage in precision. It's diagonal, which means all of these different uh, coordinates, all these different parameters are independent. And it depends on the values of the parameters. And so if I just focus on these diagonal elements and take the inverse, then I'll say, the variance in knowing the polar angle of the axis and the variance in knowing the azimuthal angle of the axis both depend on sine squared of the rotation angle, which means that if your rotation angle is zero or two pi, then sine squared of theta over two goes to zero and the thing blows up. And that kind of makes sense because if your rotation angle is zero or your rotation is two pi, then you shouldn't know what the rotation axis is because it could have been anything. And similarly, uh, just like for our long longitude latitude, if the polar angle of the rotation axis is pi or zero, then you shouldn't be able to figure out what its azimuthal angle should be. So these singularities make sense, but they're a bit annoying. 
And what you can do is say, we chose these three parameters to measure, but what if we chose a different set of three parameters? And we talked about Euler angles. Just a quick Let's, question before you yeah, yeah, yeah. continue. Mm -hmm. um, so this, the, the scaling met matrix mm -hmm. that you use, is this like inverting the quantum information matrix, which would be the metric of the space of parameters? And would that not depend on the state that you're considering? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, that's a great question. What we did was we took some special states. Um, so this is a particular state. I guess I dropped the subscript. That's my bad. Um, we took a particular state that was known to get the best average precision for single parameter estimation if you average over all rotation axes. And we asked, what is the quantum Fisher information with that special state? And what you get is you get some quantum enhanced scaling for everything, but you get something that doesn't do so well with um, when the coordinates don't make sense. So this is only for a particular state. This is, this is what gets us thinking, and then we can generalize it to any state. Um, but we know that the state should be the best. Or we, we, have, we have some intuition. Go ahead. All right, thanks. Uh, there's another question that's unrelated. Mm -hmm. So do you ever get intrinsic singularities which are not dependent on coordinates? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we'll get there. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely get there. Very good, people are anticipating the talk. Yeah, no, it's great, I love it, I love it. Um, I actually, yeah, you find them in different ways and it's always great. Um, so here we're saying, let's change parameterizations. We won't find an intrinsic singularity, but we'll find maybe get rid of the coordinate singularities if we change coordinate system. And we use Euler angles and we say, you just rotate around a bunch of different axes and, and see what happens. And if you find the quantum Fisher information in that basis, you find different coordinate singularities and, and you don't get a diagonal matrix. So just to say, it's not always diagonal. Um, if you're using these special states, you still get this very nice scaling, but you can't measure all three parameters all the time because sometimes you get a coordinate singularity. And what we did is we stared at these for a long time. And then we said, well, what happens if we take inspiration from the longitude and latitude and weigh our, um, our quantities that we're trying to optimize by the metric for uh, rotation. Uh, and a rotation operation you can define with these different coordinates. So you can actually use these different parameterizations and find different metrics for each parameterization. But so long as you use the proper metric for the angle axis parameterization or the Euler angle parameterization or one of the other Euler angle parameterizations, you always get this thing for the special states equaling some constants that have this Heisenberg scaling of n squared in the denominator and don't depend on the parameterization that you used, don't depend on the values of the parameters, and don't depend on the, um, yeah, the values of the parameters. I'll stop there. And so the question is, so we've done this, now we've got two examples. Is this general? The answer is yes, and, and we'll show why it's really cool. So, so just to summarize again, because it's always good to summarize, what we have is that not all coordinates are equal. Um, the, the, how well you can measure one parameter depends on the values of other parameters. And we have for these particular states that we looked at that we got coordinate singularities in the quantum Fisher information that we could get rid of if we weighed all the parameters by the metric. And it's always good to have a weight matrix. It's good to have a natural way of choosing that because then um, you get the single function to optimize and, and it's great. So the question is, how can you generalize this to use arbitrary states, not just our special things that looked optimal, any dynamics, not just rotations. And we can talk about in this paper, we talked about how you would actually saturate all these things and find quantum advantages. And it's really neat. And we'll get into just a few of those right now. So the ingredients we need are a little bit more math. And this is just to show how general things can be. And the most general we could make it was to take any finite dimensional unitary um, as your evolution. And that as a finite dimensional unitary would be in some number of dimensions n, which would mean it depends on some number of independent parameters. And what you can always do for any unitary matrix that's finite dimensional is choose a set of generators, generators of this Lie group that are essentially uh, basis elements of the Lie 
algebra. And it's like generalizations of the Pauli matrices, um, which would be for SU2. And you could find um, these are just Hermitian traceless matrices, and you have a set of D of them. And you can make any unitary, just like normally you look for Hamiltonian evolution, you can make any unitary as the exponential of a, a bunch of parameters, um, giving you the coefficients of each of these generators. You assume that your state evolves according to this unitary, dot, 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 dot. And then all of a sudden, you want to find out how does your state change if you just take a derivative with respect to one of the parameters. And it looks like something that there's going to be a lot of dot, dot, dots but it looks like a linear combination of the generators of the Lie group. So the generators of the Lie group are also the generators of your evolution. And what's really nice is that if you use this, you can skip all the math on the bottom and you have the quantum Fisher information, which depends on a state and the parameters, breaks into contributions from the parameters and contributions from the state. So you have these matrices that depend on the parameters, which mean they depend on the parameterization that you choose. So if you use angle axis or Euler angles or something else, and they depend on the actual values of those parameters. And those go on the outside, these matrices. And on the inside, you have a matrix that just depends on the state and the dimension um, of the unitary, I guess, which, which Lie group you're using. And so what you can do is you can talk about the different contributions to the quantum Fisher information from each of these components. And so, if you had a singularity that came from the coordinates, it had to have come from these H matrices. You could also have a singularity that just depends on the state. It comes from these C matrices and you would never be able to get around that. So you could use this to show when some state is defective in some way or not as useful or more useful just by optimizing this middle quantity, this thing that depends on the state. Um, and this will also tell you if you happen to be choosing parameters that depend on each other, it'll always be singular um, because you need everything to be independent so that this whole matrix is invertible. You can't have copies of, of different rows. So I'm not actually gonna go into what each different thing depends on. What's important is that it breaks into these different contributions. And if we ignore everything that was below and we replace it and we do some math with our metrics, what you can show is that for any geometry, and any parameterization, the metric is also given by these same H matrices. And what's really strange and important and cool about that is that if you then try and make this single scalar parameter to optimize and you weigh your covariance matrix by the metric, then you exactly cancel all of these H matrices and you get a lower bound that depends only on something that depends on the state and that depends on the uh, dimension of, of your group that you're doing. And what's really cool is that it doesn't depend on the Euler angles or the angle axis, doesn't depend on the parameterization you use, doesn't depend on the values of the parameters. Uh, it depends only on the state and I got really excited about it. So there's this last bullet point. Um, and it's, it's really cool, everything cancels and, and you have this unique thing to, to optimize and it gives you the proper way of reweighting all the different parameters and putting them together to find one thing to optimize. And this I'll, I'll definitely skip, but the idea is not only do we tell you in this paper what the parameter to optimize is, is we also can tell you how to uniquely optimize it for a fixed amount of resources. And we can compare it to different things. And what's really cool is we can show you what the optimal probe state would be for any dimensional unitary. You have uh, SU2, SU3, SU4, we can find you the optimal states, and these can be useful for um, something like, uh, so you're measuring 3D polarization, or you're measuring things with uh, interesting spin states or atoms with multiple energy levels, and you've got a bunch of them. Uh, any of these dynamics that can be, can be contained in a finite dimensional unitary, we can tell you how to optimize the probe state, and we can tell you how to saturate the inequalities, so we can tell you how to find the optimal measurements as well, um, given all of this prescription. But, but that's, that's probably a bit too much math. So let's end with some words, and then we can have lots of questions. So, so I told you this kind of in the order that we thought of it, but now I'll tell you it in the order that if you want to tell your friend about this talk, this is what I would say. 
and, and then we can have a, a longer discussion. So I'd say, if you want to tell your friend about these cool results, then you would say in the real world, when you want to measure things, it's very hard to measure one thing at a time. And so since you have to measure more than one thing at a time, you have to choose one particular thing to optimize that will be some sort of combination of all the different things that you're measuring. And then you'll say, if those multiple things that you're measuring happen to come from a finite dimensional unitary interaction, and that finite dimensional can be any finite dimension, so it can be, there are lots of different things, then there's always a natural thing you can choose as your way of weighing all the variances and covariances, which would be to use the metric that defines the geometry of that finite dimensional unitary. And if you do that, you can go and tell your friend that um, it doesn't matter what probe state you use, if you use a mixed state, if you use a pure state, you can always get results that are independent from the parameterization that you choose, independent from the actual values of the parameters, and so you can have this individual quantity that depends only on the state that you can then optimize and find out how, to, how much information you could get about those parameters. Uh, and, and you can tell them if they wanna know how to find the optimal states and the optimal measurements, then uh, they'd have to go and read our paper. But what's really cool is that some of these things have actually been generated in the few particle regimes. So um, in Ottawa, Fred Bouchard did this before I joined. And in Toronto, Hugo Ferretti did in another physical system. And this is written in his PhD thesis. So these can be made. There's lots of cool, lots of cool things there. And then to keep for yourself, that's what you should tell your friend. To keep for yourself is that there's this really deep connection between geometry and quantum Fisher information matrices. And this deep connection, um, we've, we've explored this one aspect of it, but there's probably lots more out there in terms of connections between metrology and geometry. And so this is a really neat field to, to be a part of. And I encourage you to at the very least stay tuned to the exciting results that I'm sure will keep coming from us and from everyone else in the world. So with that, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to talk to you. I'll list my employers and sponsors over here. Thank you all for your attention and open the floor to any and all questions. All right, thank you very much for this talk. This was a really a really nice talk. I thought it was a really nice pace on, on everything as well. Yeah, much appreciated. Um, so we've got one question from an anonymous attendee that I think is the question I've heard in the most quantum talks ever. Mm -hmm. What about noise? <laughs> yeah, what about so, noise? So I'm just going to my picture because I like pictures. Let's say we take this picture. Um, that's a different direction that everyone's going in in quantum metrology research, which says, what if this picture is not correct because you haven't isolated this picture enough? And there are other environmental factors that are affecting everything from the probe state to the dynamical process to the final state to the measurement. And um, the results we have here are, are not going to tell you how to avoid this noise, but they'll still be useful for telling you what combination of things you should be looking at or would be a, a logical thing to look at in, sorry, it's too long of a sentence. Even in the presence of noise, you still have to choose whether you care more about longitude or latitude. And so you can still say, even in the presence of noise, I'm gonna choose this optimal linear combination of, of longitude and latitude as my thing to optimize. I'm gonna choose to optimize this particular combination. And you can do that in the presence of noise or not the presence of noise. What you can't do in the presence of noise is use our optimal probe states necessarily. They could, they could get destroyed by noise. And that's um, an important question and, and there's lots more to do for that. I think you're muted, Hugo. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, okay. Linked with the Fisher information metric, how does noise uh, affect your affect your metric directly? Uh, so I'd say it uh, it affects noise can affect the state, and so that can change all of these quantities because you're taking derivatives of of the state and you're you're comparing the state. But if your noise is in your dynamical interaction, then it changes the final state and it changes how your final state depends on, on everything. Um, but I don't have a good, maybe you're looking for a good geometrical picture of how 
all of these, this quantum phase formation is, is changing with noise that happens on the state. And I think that's probably something interesting to look into because I hope that there's a good geometrical answer to that question. You can talk about specific things like mixing your state with um, some fraction of a maximally mixed state. And then you can, you can answer these questions, but just for a general, even like small amounts of noise and how things get, get um, I forgot my words, so just get changed slightly. Um, you could probably do something interesting with the geometry. All right, thanks. We have another question here. What about selecting the W weight in experiment where on, where, oh, let me see how I can read this question, where I only care about a single parameter, but other parameters come from some uncontrolled source? Uh, yes, yes. So then you have to worry. Um, what we've done is for any set of parameters that all come from a unitary interaction, um, typically when you're thinking about these uncontrolled sources of errors, you might, uh, you might not just be thinking of that. Um, but it's possible if you know for sure that you only care about one parameter or one subset of unitary, you can then choose your weight matrix and just manually say, I'm gonna choose a weight matrix that only cares about this one parameter. Um, and, and you're always free to do that. Um, this is, I guess, more for uh, an agnostic point when you literally are trying to find where you are on the earth and you wanna know which coordinates to use. Um, if you know you only care about one thing, you could actually use this formalism and, and, and you could even use this formalism with just subsets of the metric. So here are the metrics in two dimensions. So a subset is just one point, but you could have five coordinates and only care about two of them. And then you could still talk about this as the proper way of weighing those two different values within the five different parameters that might exist. All right, thanks. I have a question myself as well. So you Please. conclude by saying that there's a, a close link between your, your uh, I guess, parameter measurements and your geometry. Mm -hmm. In a very complicated system, would the first step be to consider the actual topology of your, of your system? Because now you give a lot of examples with a sphere, but if that mm -hmm. sphere were a torus, then the whole everything would be different and, and you wouldn't have a, such a close link. Yes. Between. Uh, yeah, so what's useful or not useful is we've only done this for finite dimensional unitaries. And so that restricts, the, it's a wide range, but that restricts the, the total number of different types of interactions that we can do. And so I suspect that there are connections um, that you can do for, for other interactions, but we just haven't, haven't done the math yet. Uh, and that's maybe you can do it if you want for what happens when you have some other Lie group, let's say it's still a Lie group, but you don't have it being SUN. And so I, I still suspect that there are these strong connections bit, uh, to the geometry, but you would have to, to make things more concrete for sure. So that's why it's exciting for me, because I think this, is, this was just based on some things that looked nice and then we could generalize it this many steps but it's very possible that it could be generalized again and again. And that would Other, be yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And I can just reiterate, um, when we found this thing, it looks like the metric, but that's because we used a particular state. If we'd used another state that was not very good, we could have gotten garbage here and we never would have known to think about connecting it to the metric. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that because we used the state, it worked and then we had this idea, but like there could be lots more out there that we just haven't stumbled upon yet and cool connections abound. All right, I think we have one last question here. So have you guys started using this in experiments at the NRC yet? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And it really depends. So we have SUN can, is something mathematical and there are different physical situations to which it can be applied. And so the thing that's been done actually at the University of Ottawa um, was creating uh, states that have the proper properties to have these special Heisenberg scaling. Um, and this first thing was done for showing the best possible precision of estimated rotations around a whole bunch of different axes um, in some orbital angular momentum degree of freedom of light. And that's really cool because you can do a lot of really interesting things. And the drawback is that rotation in that sense 
is a bit of a simulation of a rotation. There isn't so much of a physical rotation process that corresponds to the proper transformation of orbital angular momentum states of light. Um, what Hugo Ferretti was doing was instead of creating these states in orbital angular momentum, was using intrinsic polarization of light. And then a rotation would actually physically be related to some sort of polarization change, which could have three dimensions. And so uh, that's something that he, he succeeded in making, um, didn't do all the measurements with it, more just characterized these optimum states. And so, so it's still a work in progress. In terms of doing it with spins, I don't think anyone's done it, but that would be really useful for a natural magnetic field sensing problem. And, and so there's lots that can still be done, but I'd say this is in its infancy in terms of the experimental uh, progress and there's lots that can still be done. All right, well, I think that's it for the questions. So let me just thank you again. This was a really great talk. And I think we had some, some really fun questions as well. Yeah, um, I really appreciated all the questions.